Welcome to Travel Baseball Coach Justin Podcast. Travel Baseball Coach Justin interviews travel baseball coaches, tournament directors, and former players from around the nation. Here's Travel Baseball Coach Justin. Welcome to Travel Baseball Coach Justin Podcast. I'm Travel Baseball Coach Justin, and I'm here with a very special guest, uh, Bill Rao. Uh, Welcome, Bill. How are you? I'm doing great, Justin. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, can you kind of let us know what you're doing right now um, with baseball? Yeah, absolutely. I guess it's probably easiest to start where my playing career ended in 2007 in the Milwaukee Brewers organization uh, after minor league ball. I had the opportunity to work still in baseball, but in the film industry. And that was kind of an interesting twist. So I, I shifted career paths and got into the film industry for 10, 15 years. And we can get into a little more of those details later. But after that period of time, I went back to Oregon state and I coached uh, as an undergraduate assistant coach there 2018 through 2020 and then moved back down here to Southern Oregon where I'm from a graduate of Ashland high school class of 2002. And I've been coaching the summer collegiate wood bat team, the Medford rogues down here for the last three seasons. And after last summer season, we started our own youth baseball organization, Southern Oregon baseball development. we got a 12 U, a 13 U baseball team and an 18 U showcase team. And then this season, I jumped on board with Southern Oregon University women's softball program, and I've been coaching a lot of softball now, too. So just full-time coach, doing some farming. Uh, we put this sweet baseball batting cage into our farm building here, so got a lot of lessons going on and just, you know, living the coach lifestyle, as you know. It, and it is a lifestyle. Man, that is a lot. I don't know how you do it, um, but that is a lot. So. You mentioned you were, uh, after uh, baseball, you went into the film industry. I noticed that you were on Grim. You're part of the Grim. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and I guess technically I still am in the film industry since I'm occasionally going up and doing some broadcasting for the Beaver Baseball on Pac-12 Network. But it all started, I mean, my, my parents were both actors. My father was an actor here at the Shakespeare Festival. And right after my playing career was over, I had the opportunity to be what's called a technical advisor for baseball for a baseball movie which means you're the guy on set making sure it all looks realistic and the players and the umpires are doing what they're supposed to do to look like baseball players and not actors and then from there i actually went and worked on the film twilight the first twilight movie there's a baseball scene in it and so i went up to portland and i was on set for a month working with the first team and second team and the stunt unit so the, all the stand-ins all the actors all the stunt doubles making sure everybody knew what they were doing for baseball and making sure it looked realistic and coaching them. Uh, and then I stuck around in the film industry for a long time. I was on the TV show Grimm for all five seasons, uh, worked on it with my little brother, which was really fun. And uh, then jumped on board with Oregon State University as an undergraduate assistant coach, kind of got back into the coaching world and then moved back down to Southern Oregon to be a coach full time. Man, that is a lot. I mean, Grimm and then the Twilight series, those are some big shows i mean twilight is that the movie or yeah the movie yep yeah the first movie they they filmed it in portland and washington and right. there's a scene where the the family likes to play baseball they've been playing baseball for 150 years together but they can only play during a thunderstorm because they hit the ball so hard that they need the thunder to mask the sound of them hitting the bat and so that we went out to a field in the middle of the woods and and filmed a really cool baseball scene with a bunch of you know special effects and practical effects of like ball launchers and actors tied to cables so they could jump 50 feet in the air and right. you know my job was basically there to make people like round the bases properly or make sure the umpire was standing in the right position and a couple of the actors had to pitch and one of them had to hit left-handed and neither of them had any baseball experience so trying in a couple of weeks to make them look like they had been playing baseball for 150 years was right. no easy task but we we did the best we could with the time we had hey camera angle is everything on the bat swing right there if you have yes to. yeah exaggerated motions i had the i had the girl had ballerina or a ballet experience so i just had her do a really high old school leg kick like she had been playing baseball since you know the year 1800 and just yeah. the release wasn't pretty but the rest of the motion and looked pretty believable and so that was that was what we came up with uh, man i'm gonna go back and watch that because I, I don't remember it uh, it's got a cult following man they do articles oh, yeah. about that baseball scene because it's like kind of cheesy but also kind of cool oh. and it was very fun to work on the baseball scene has a cult following yeah like the specific uh, baseball scene because there's some weird music playing and it's like 
kind of cheesy and it's a weird idea to have right. this family playing baseball out in the middle this family of vampires playing baseball out in the middle of the woods and that's actually how i heard about the movie the first time when i was working on a show down here the producer comes up and says hey there's a vampire baseball movie being filmed in portland and they want you to go help with it and i'm just thinking sure. vampire baseball movie like all right like whatever and that and it was twilight man how great is that i mean that and then grim um and what i do know about grim is like the whole the special effects guy mm -hmm. i read in the oregon stater magazine that uh he he's an alumnus of oregon state am i right he does all those effects where they transform into these animals and back yeah we we had a like a like a special effects makeup person and then a digital effects person the so digital, there's it was a digital effects. yeah yeah, the, the humans would morph into animals and they put all these little tracking marks all over their face and then CG, you know, the werewolf, a man turning into a werewolf, basically. Yeah. And yeah, I think Gary Parks, maybe uh, he was on set with us, but it's a whole team, you know, it's like right. there's oh, one guy on set doing it, but then they send it back to the lab and 50 people get to touch it a little bit. Yeah. No, when I read that, I was just like, man, what a small world. I mean, I'm an Oregon State alum. You know that. I don't think my people in my podcast know that. I think that's the first time I mentioned it, but. I read that. I was like, wow, man, to be a part of such a big, huge hit series on, I think it's NBC. If, if I'm yep. Correct. But um, yeah, that, that is absolutely awesome. Um, there was a lot, a lot of Oregon state and Oregon. Uh, I mean, the whole crew's from Portland. We, there was only maybe 15 or 20 people out of, out of a 150 person crew that didn't live locally because that's a cheaper way to make the show. And yeah. Portland has a really huge film industry and a, and a crew base. So a lot, a lot of people. I mean, my little brother was working on shows with these Oregon State alumni when we were winning the College World Series, and it's just the whole crew's got beaver gear on, and every, they got the game playing on the side. I mean, it's it's a real uh, local feel for a show like yeah, that. So it's fun when a home. yeah, it's it's fun when a big show like that comes to Portland. There was I was on IMDb. I do my research on everybody. <laughs> All right. My favorite show. Uh, this is a long time ago, though. Like. Okay late 2000s when i saw it i absolutely loved it because i grew up in lake, lake oswego and i moved down to the uh -huh. 2001 it's called portlandia and i think yeah a uh, ball player or something like in that in that one i love that show when that show first came out it was like I, that's where i grew up you know 20 yeah years. like and then for fred armiston and um i forget uh, something brownstein i forget her name they are carrie i think they're absolutely great at uh, the their their storylines, and they actually capture the 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 uniqueness of people that live in Portland and keeping it weird. Perfect. I was laughing so hard. I was rolling out of my chair. And I'll just I'll just touch one scene. It was when uh, Fred Armiston was the uh, bike uh, enforcer, and he's like going through uh, Lloyd Center. Uh, through like you know a, a clothing department on his bike, you know, going left, left, you know. <laughs> oh my God, that you know the, because the bike laws up there are are really you know out there to protect the bikers and everything. Uh, bicyclists, sorry, not bikers, but bicyclists. Oh man, I just died. I was just like, dude, how do you? They're great. They're great. So. I don't know if you got to meet any of them or anything like that, but uh, yeah, I mean, I was on that episode, that show for a couple episodes. I acted in it as a baseball player. And then okay. I got to like do some, some FaceTime with Fred and I played a bartender and he was just kind of rambling at me while I was cleaning a glass. I didn't have any lines, but right. that dude comes up with all that material in the moment and then does it differently every take. And every take is hilarious. He can just go for like 20 minutes on an idea and it's just funny the whole entire time. I mean, he's a really a comedic genius. Yeah, it, well, it, it, he, the way he captures like the feeling and the, he really gets, he understands this. He can mimic people from Portland. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's just, anyway, I thought yeah. that was great. When I saw Portland, I was like, wow, man. All right. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I kind of want to get back to baseball. That's kind of what my podcast is, is Travel Baseball Coach. <laughs> Um, you were part of uh, two national championships with Oregon State, one as a player and then one as a coach. Yep. Uh, 06 and uh, was it 18? Yep. 2018? Okay, yeah. Yeah, we got the 2018 jersey right right here hanging in the background. That was my coaching oh, yeah. jersey when we won it. Yeah, yep. And was that the same jersey as the 06 year? It's not. We it's were, not. Uh, yeah, no, it's a different that jersey. Six year was my favorite jersey out of all the Beaver jerseys that ever been. The worn. cream, the cream colored ones. Well, it's the it's the font of OSU. Oh, yeah, it's that font. Yeah. And it's it's just it, it's unique. It's not 
there's not another team that I've seen with that font out there. So it's like just Oregon State all by itself. And when you see it, or when I see it, I just think national champs. Yeah. So anyway. Right on. Yeah, they were good years. There's fun times. So for me, since you've been there as a coach and a ball player, um, as a ball player, winning a national championship, I mean, can you describe the feeling that you that went through? Or, I mean, the journey of going to Omaha and all this, you know, fanfare and everything like that. I mean, give me a little, a little story about you going through, you know, um, becoming a champion. Yeah, it was it was an interesting route for me because I I first signed to play at University of California Santa Barbara and the Beavers didn't offer me any kind of scholarship and and so for me it, it really wasn't a, an option to go there at that point but I went to Santa Barbara for 3 years played pretty well got a lot of time and actually in my freshman year I, I went to Omaha with our coach to coach a camp and I got to watch the College World Series and one of the guys I played with in high school was playing second base for Stanford at the time as a freshman. And I remember being in the stands and just watching him on the field thinking, Oh my gosh, dude, that is crazy down there. And I went up and asked him, you know, what's it like? And he said, it's a dream, bro. I, I can't, there's no way to explain it. And then luckily I transferred. And as a senior, we went back and honestly, it didn't hit me the magnitude of those games in that stadium until the first pitch happened. And I was pretty relaxed, pretty chill, opening ceremonies, announcements, even warming up and throwing ground balls. But as soon as it was like, oh man, a ground ball might come my way. Like all of a sudden you feel your heart just starting to go and you're like, all right, take a breath. This is what it's going to be like. You need to just yeah. like figure out a way to relax and play your game. So yeah. pretty wild. And I mean, I, I had a, a pretty good series uh, that week. I was just very fortunate to hit really well. I think I ended up hitting like 450 that week and, you know, made first team all tournament and, I got to, I hit a go ahead home run in the championship series. I got to score the winning run and a, a kid from Crater High School, Ryan Gibson, who's a current coach at Oregon State, is actually the one who hit me in for the winning run. So it was a guy I played against in high school, hit me in for the winning run of the World Series with a bunch of guys I played with through high school. So, I mean, an incredibly special experience to do that with a bunch of guys from the Northwest and then to go back in 2018 and be fortunate enough to get to witness that whole thing as a coach was just, I mean, it changes your whole life. And it's something that really gives you the satisfaction of like being content with what, with your baseball career. And a lot, a lot of guys just feel like they need to play pro ball for a long time before they can be satisfied with the amount of work they put in. And I, I feel blessed to get to experience a college world series like that, because for me, I, I never wanted to dedicate my entire life forever to playing professional baseball and when your playing career is over, it makes you question your identity when you're not a baseball player anymore. And since I got into coaching, it's really filled that gap in my life. And I think now I'm probably doing just as much baseball and softball, if not more than I was as a player, but I, I just have more energy. I'm enjoying the rest of my life. I can still go golfing and fishing and take care of my coaching. So the sport is still giving back to me. And I think probably giving me more now than it, than it ever has, honestly. Well, I think, you know, we're more mature later on in life in that we cherish uh, the actual interactions that we have, whereas a ball player, we're in the learning process, we're in the education process of, you know, being taught what to do. Now we're doing it as coaches. And so when you see that kid advance and move up and they don't see it, they're just like, they're having a good time. It just, it's self-rewarding. And so it doesn't matter if it's my daughter with her softball or a couple of her uh, teammates or whatever, if I help them out with something and they improve. I go, hey, man, I, I had a little something to do with that. You know, they have to put the effort yeah. in, of course. But, yeah, I think I don't know. It's just that that's awesome. So between the two national championships, is there um, something that happened, like, during that week that you didn't expect to have happen, that you couldn't even have thought of happened, but just happened? And it was just a random, in you know, instance. Anything like that? You talking about like uh, on the field during the during the tournament or field, off the field? It could be at a restaurant, something happened or just something random that you're like, wow, I never thought that would have happened um, during, you know, championship week in Omaha. Um, yeah, I mean, we experienced a couple of really crazy rain delays in the middle of game where we had to go into the locker room for like two hours, you know, and that's always really interesting in the middle of a game when you have to have that much downtime in a really important game. And and I think um, even that whole week in general, you're, you're just trying to do something to keep yourself happy and alert, but not stress out too much. So there's a lots of lots of like little trips on the side to go fishing or to play, you know, this game that Oregon State plays called Mafia, which is sort of like a 
like a group game where you pick people and want you have to decide who's the murderer, who's the sheriff, who's the victim. And we just play these involved games with each other, basically, to kind of keep your minds active, stay sharp, but also rest and not stress out at the same time. And honestly, as a, as a player, the first year, what I remember the most is having my family there. It was my brother's 21st birthday during that week. So the, having the whole family there and just seeing my brother – while I'm stressing out on the field and, and, you know, having this in these intense moments. And, and for me, it was just all focused the whole time, but to see him with the other brothers and sisters and parents just partying it up in the stands and enjoying that whole experience and, and just hearing about uh, what that experience was like for people around the state and around the country. I think for me, that was the most special um, part that you don't really realize it's happening while it's happening. But after the fact, you're able to view the experience from outside of the player perspective and you you start to understand the scope of the whole thing, which if you had thought about that beforehand, you probably would have been too stressed out. But afterwards, you're like, oh, man, that was kind of a big deal. And 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 it's awesome how much it meant for for so many people. Right. So that that's exactly what I was looking for. Something just like that. And I also want to mention that the Beavs actually made the College World Series in 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, year before so they made it three years in a row and i and i remember i think we beat north carolina back to back in 06 and 07 is that correct yeah yeah but what i thought was really interesting is jacoby ellsbury was the center fielder in 05 and he decided to uh go into the draft ended up being i think on boston was it boston yeah yeah okay so i'm thinking oh my gosh he just missed out on this whole experience here but then he has the most ridiculous year and experience himself in 06. He ends up beating out Coco Crisp for the starting position in center field during the division series. Yeah. I'm like, how does a rookie beat out a pro in his prime during like the AL division series? Ends up uh, winning the World Series with the, with the Red Sox that year. And I was like, you know what, Jacoby? You made the right decision. I mean, yeah, that's it. That's the year they broke the curse, right? I can't remember if it was or not, but I just remember he he left and then he won a World Series there. And I played yeah. with Jacoby in, in high school with Baseball Northwest, and he's a kid from a small town in eastern Oregon yeah. of Madras. Mm -hmm. But you always knew, like, when we'd go to tournaments, you know, we had some good players on that team, but when Jacoby came up, I mean, five-tool athlete, you could hear the stopwatches and the papers shuffling in the stands because it wasn't just like – one or two scouts and coaches were looking at him. It was like every single scout and coach was watching this guy. So really special to see him succeed at the major league level. And he made quite a career of it. I know he got injured and kind of lost a few years, but we're all super happy for him. I just saw a picture. He's like back with David Ortiz and Dustin Pedroia at Fenway, like enjoying some time watching games. So he, he's still living that lifestyle and enjoying his time. Oh yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you for uh, winning the national championship for Oregon State because me, my dad, my brother were watching that 06. Well, we watched 05, 06, 07. But that 06 series when we we pulled it down or you guys pulled it down. Dude, I can't, I can't explain what I went through, man. Just emotions like, oh, my God, my alma mater, they did it. You know what I mean? They're like, they're national champs. And, and I knew that next year was going to be a really good year, too. I didn't know they were going to repeat. I mean, you don't ever expect a repeat, but you knew, I knew we were going to probably be in the top eight again and get the Super Regional again and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, as a fan, I just want to say thank you for participating in that and, and doing all that because it really, I don't know, it didn't validate me, but it just it was just it was so fun to watch because it, it, there's not a lot of sports nowadays where you care about teams because the players, you know, flip and everything. But man, when watching Oregon State Beaver baseball, man, I could follow that team anywhere they go. So yeah, I could tell you that the the players really have a lot of love for the fans and the alumni. And and looking back on it, a, a little piece of those championships go to everyone who was ever at that school or rooted for Oregon State because, like you said, it, it was a long time coming. In that '05 season, they went out after two games, and then in '06 we played Miami in the first game and lost eleven to one. So it was kind of looking like you know, two years in a row of losing two games in a row and getting out of there and right. something happened and we just flipped the switch and battled back through the loser's bracket. And then right. in 2007, I think the team was fifth in the Pac-10 at that time, uh, still barely made it into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. 
and then just rolled through. And when I went out and I watched that 07 championship, they made it look so easy to win the Calls World Series. And I was so, I was like jealous and a little frustrated. I was like, do you know how hard that is to win out here? I mean, we battled back through the loser's bracket is everything we had. And then they just roll out the next year and just like make it look easy against the same team. And so pretty, pretty right. awesome. And that's, and that's baseball for you. It's like, mm -hmm. you don't have to be the most talented team. You just have to be the better team on that day in that moment. And you can yep. come away with a win. So yeah. that's, that we definitely didn't have all the draft good. picks. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have close to the amount of first round draft picks or future major league players as all the other teams we were playing, but we were grittier and we were tougher. And I feel like we just had the resolve to find a way to make it work. And we, our mentality was just be the last team standing, right? This is a, this is a fight. We're about to get into a brawl. As long as we come out as the last team at the end of the whole thing, that's all that matters. So no matter how we get it done, let's just get it done. Right. Oh my gosh. Now, uh, Pat Casey was your manager at the time. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of respect for that man. So can you shed some light on, I, I mean, just walking on the field, you just, he just carries a swagger, uh, mm -hmm. you know, confidence. Uh, and this is even before they went, they went to the college world series. So, uh, he's certainly a mature, um, individual where he just knows who he is how he wants to coach can you give me any insight on pat casey that you you liked or or you know that amazed you yeah well i'll tell you i'll tell you a story about pat and i and i knew pat uh in high school playing up at oregon state for like baseball oregon and stuff and he'd pop in and out of games and obviously when he shows up you want to play really well and right. It just so happened when he showed up, I never played really well. So I, and that's part of the reason why I probably didn't get an offer to Oregon State. But after my junior year at Santa Barbara, I had the worst hitting year of my college career. And I think I hit like 240, 250 or something like that, maybe. And I was feeling pretty down on myself. And in my exit meeting in Santa Barbara, the coach told me that I probably wouldn't be starting as a senior. And he was really disappointed in the year I had. And you know, that was part of my decision to transfer out of there was just thinking like, you know, this coach doesn't believe in me and, and I need to find a place where at least I'm going to be supported by my family or my friends. And at Oregon State, it was closer to home and it was a bunch of guys I had played with in high school. So I had been coming back to Oregon to play summer ball and I made that decision to transfer without having talked to Pat Casey once. Like I played against Oregon State. I hit a couple home runs off him when I was at Santa Barbara. And I think that was when Pat Casey really was upset that they let someone from Oregon go right. play on another team who ended up playing well against them. And so I knew like after the game, when we'd shake hands, he'd come by and he'd be like, nice game, young man, really sorry we let you go, you know, or just say something like, like, we're bummed you're not playing for us sort of a deal. Nice. And but but really, like the transfer was scary, because you can't talk to them, you can't talk about scholarships, you can't have any conversations with them, you basically have to make the decision to leave Santa Barbara and go to Oregon State. And I remember going onto that campus. And the first thing Pat Casey said to me was, I want you walking around this campus, like you're going to hit 20 home runs this year. You know, and just that alone as like your first intro is like, all right, this coach has got confidence in me. He believes in me no matter what kind of season yeah. I had last year. And and that just continued with his actions all throughout the year of just supporting players, you know, showing up early. Um, just you could tell his buy in to the program was greater than the player buy in, which you notice like there's no way to fake that. And college players can see how hard their coaches are working and nobody works harder than Pat Casey to make that team better. So mad respect for Pat. We're still really close and he's a great dude. Yeah. Really well, special human. When I, uh, well, I, I enjoyed him as a coach for the wins and everything like that, but uh, he, I remember I read an article. I'm going to use some of his verbiage. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got hit up by Notre Dame pretty hard. To come, yeah, he did. Uh, come coach for Notre Dame after the second. Yep. And, and yep. I remember in an article I was reading, he was like, yeah, it's like the mothership calling me in because uh, Pat's Catholic. And yeah. a better place to, you know, uh, coach baseball and also have your faith involved with it than Notre Dame. And he passed on it. And I, after that article, I went, man, this guy's it. He's solid. <laughs> I'm like, he knows yep. what he wants. And he, he, he said he passed. And I, and, and I was, I was absolutely in shock when I read that article. Not that going to Notre Dame would have been better. I mean, he created this, you know, awesome program that still his 
um, influence is still felt today with that team and and certainly me as a fan and everything like that. So uh, yeah, when I read that article, I was just like, okay, that guy is so legit. <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah, I'm, he's a family man and he's a servant to his community and his family. And I think one of the big reasons for not going to Notre Dame was his son, John, who's about my age, um, who's like lives at home and, and requ- is a, you know, requires care basically right. full time. And, and John didn't want to leave Corvallis. And, and that was enough for Pat to say that he wanted to stick around. And I mean, that happened again to Pat uh, when LSU was hiring a few years ago and they flew him out. And I I mean, I don't know how public this is, but I can say it now because he turned it down. I mean, they offered him like $2 million a year, everything he would want, use of a private jet anytime he wanted, and he still didn't go, right? And it's like somebody like that who's just that dedicated to the family and the community and Oregon State, I mean, that's it's a once in a lifetime human being. And the the man will never sacrifice his like morals, ethics or his code for for anything that he doesn't believe in 100 percent. And it's it's really a role model to every person who's ever been around him or played for him. Yeah. And, and that testament is amazing. I believe all of that. And we are lucky to have him. Absolutely. Yeah. Lucky. And so, yeah. Um, Anyway, can't wait. He'll be down here. He's coming down for a, for a camp for us in the next few months. So we'll be on the lookout. We'll get, we'll get you. Which is, anything you got going, which one? Yeah. So you, yeah. This other it's it's going to be once we open up the new softball facility with this new oh, right. uh, youth softball organization. And once we have use of that facility, we'll yeah. I'll be able to run a, run a baseball camp in there on the weekend. And that's what we're going to get Pat down for. Right. And so do you want to mention the name of that or you want to hold off on that? Southern Oregon Fast Pitch and Blackout Softball is the name of the organization. Right. I, I'm on; it's a nonprofit. I'm on their board. I'm helping with the coaching and, and setting up the teams and, and giving lessons. And we and we're about to we're about to set up a, a large facility to get going for all the teams to practice in. Well, my daughter's on that 14U team. Nice. So I don't nice. know if you know that, but I yeah, no. But Kevin's that. Kevin's an awesome coach. There's some really talented players on that team too. So yeah, and then uh, I can't wait for them to close on that building whenever it happens. So yeah, perfect. Um, then from there, uh, let's see here. You played uh, minor league ball for a year for the Brewers. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I was a senior sign. I didn't hear my name get called in the draft, uh, unfortunately, and and that was an interesting route. And we can get into that on another episode if you want. Okay. But I did I did sign. Uh, they gave me a little bit of money, and I I went out to Helena, Montana, to play short season single a and the pioneer league before it folded. And honestly, like I love the sport of baseball and I'm a lifer in it, but the, the amount of sacrifices that you have to make to be a professional athlete was just something that I was not ready to do with the rest of my life. I I really enjoy fly fishing and river rafting and golfing with my father and, and these things that I just knew I would have to miss out on a lot of, if I wanted to play professional sports and, and honestly, after winning a college world series and getting out there and realizing like, okay, you're good enough to play professional baseball. I, I thought in my mind, it would take me about five years to get to the major league level. And the only thing keeping me around at that point was the hope to be famous and rich. And once you have that come to that realization, you realize that you don't really want it. You have to love the sport. And and if you're on the fence about sticking around just for the money, in my opinion, there's someone else who really wants it and there's a limited amount of spots. So before going back to spring training the next season, I I basically asked for my release and moved into the film industry instead of being a player. Hey, good for you to figure that out that early. Yeah. No regrets for me. I didn't want to waste any more, any more years of my life in that situation. Yeah. That's awesome. And you know, like you said, the national championship kind of capped it for you. Just like I attained college's highest level of honor right there. And, you know, you played a season in uh, single A and you're just like, not for me. Uh, yeah i'll tell you what it's competitive i know it's competitive i i see it it's just holy smokes all these kids they they think they're gonna be mlb stars and i'm just like you know what let's get your swing set first yeah i mean i asked a scout in in college when he called me to talk to me i think it was a red Sox scout and i just asked him you know as a as a player i'm saying I think he called me to ask me about Mitch or someone else on the team and about their character. And and I just asked him while I had him on the phone, what separates players at the professional level? Like who makes it and who doesn't? And he just straight up told me, he said, the grind, you know, it's like, you have to be able to make it through the grind. And I thought in college, it was already great. And then you get to the pro level and now it's your job. It's not just like you're a college athlete and you're taking school and you're going home. I mean, you're an adult 
baseball is your job and you're playing every day at the field, 10 a.m., practicing for four or five hours, and then you have a game every night and you're eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bananas and making 1200 bucks a month or something like that. Yeah. And they just changed that now. At least you're going to get minimum wage. But before it was like $1.85 an hour when we did the math, right? So it's like it is a tough lifestyle. It is a grind. And if you don't love – busting your chops every day from sun up to sundown, you know, in baseball, then I I'm just telling you right now, like it's not for you to be a pro player. You better get your mind wrapped around like dedicating your entire life to that sport. If you want to make it at that level. Yeah, that's some great insight there for all anybody with that pro ambition. Um, oh yeah. 48. I'll have a chance. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I wish I would have spent more time learning how to love that process, right? Instead of feeling like you're forcing yourself to go work out or you have to go take a thousand swings in order to get better. It's like you have to learn how to set up the practice time to make it enjoyable for you so that you want to go do it instead of feeling like you have to go do it. And that's just such an important thing, I think, for young players at the practices to like sustain the love for the game, because if they're already getting burnt out, between 12 and 13 years old, then by the time they get to high school and they really have to step it up another notch, it's going to feel like work instead of like play. And then you just got to make it feel like play. And you got to remind yourself how lucky you are to be playing a game and potentially getting paid for it. And I think there's a lot of kids nowadays who just want the clout on social media of saying right. that they're a varsity player or saying that they're a college player when they don't really want to do what it takes to succeed all they want is to just like have that feather in their cap and be like yep i'm a college baseball player it's like well you are and you aren't i mean if you're not really in love with the sport and grinding it to your maximum potential then you know you're probably not going to be able to make it any farther than where you're at right now right and there's one other aspect of it is like for me it was like nutrition and mm -hmm. the importance of nutrition is to keep your body from getting irritable Mm -hmm. If your body's irritable, your brain and your personality, your attitude is going to follow it because your body's just going to be sitting there going, I'm irritable, I'm irritable, I'm irritable. So I don't want to go into nutrition. I, I just wanted to point that out. But that No, it's good. It's That's facts. It's harder at the minor league level because you're getting paid 1200 bucks a month right. and the bus is stopping at like Taco Bell every night. And like, wow. that's your option. If you don't, if you wouldn't... don't, I'm telling you, if you don't have thousands of dollars from mom and dad or you're not right. working all during the off season then you do not have enough money to go get organic produce or go to whole foods for your dinner and it and a lot of those places are closed by the time you get access to them as well so it, it is a very difficult thing to maintain good nutrition uh in college right when your right. school's not paying for your food and you're responsible for making your own food right and most you're, families you're, can't you've been on the baseball team yeah, I mean, Oregon State's really fortunate because they have a little budget for food and there's a little okay. kitchen in there, right? So you can fill up when you're in their little kitchen. But like when I was there, nothing. There was no kitchen. That's wow. like been a recent development in the last like five years. You'd have some snacks in the dugout or there'd be like a Gatorade nutrition bar and like a chocolate right. milk for you after you worked out, right? You'd get a little little protein shake after you worked out. But in terms of overall, it's like you're making bagel sandwiches and top ramen and trying to like, you know, do rice and chicken as many nights a week as your as your brain is going to let you do just to try and not eat pizza and burritos every night. Wow. Yeah. No. And the reason why I bring up nutrition is a lot of the kids that I'm seeing on social on the socials that I'm on as travel baseball coach Justin is they're, they're talking a lot about, you know, pounding a couple bangs or rain energy drinks, um, like two a, a day uh, for, a, you know, like a full play two games or something like that. That's you know, sad. We're talking like 14U, 15U, 16U. And I'm like, yeah. boy, you cannot do that. Those things have too many uh, vitamins and minerals that actually overworks your liver and kidney to mm. the point where you're going to be irritable. And so yeah. if, you're finding, if you're listening right now and you're irritable and you're pounding two of those on, on Saturday and two of those on Sunday, um, find something that has below the 100% vitamin B6 or 100% of whatever the vitamins are in there, because a lot of those are actually like a thousand, 1250% of your daily dose. Well, yeah, B12, especially. They really, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, and that's, and the reason why they, I found out why they do that. Those are really uh, sweet vitamins, so it, it adds to the sweetness of the drink, and so that's mm. why they crank it up in there is to, for the flavor profile. So, yeah, I did, I did not know little, that. Yeah, I did a little research on it. Uh, my doctor helped me about it because 
Um, I was taking some blood tests and she, uh, uh, my doctors and she was kind of tweaking me in on these vitamins and about this, and this was over a course of 18 months and um, about the fifth blood test in, she goes, you drinking bang or, or rain? And I went, yeah. She goes, how many wig? I just said two. And this was two a week. She goes, yeah. your liver and kidney enzymes. And I went, ooh, there, it says high. She goes, yeah, stop. And I did. I, I quit cold turkey. So I, what I do now is uh, Celsius. I just, I just need the energy. I need caffeine, basically. Yeah. I don't need all those vitamins and stuff. So I do like Celsius, which has 200 milligrams of caffeine, but it'll have like 20% vitamins and, and the minerals. I look at that. I, I don't want anything over 100%. So anyway. That's my yeah, no, that's good. I, I switched to Yerba Mate for my caffeine intake yeah. instead of those bang drinks. And then a lot of times I've found that if I just have enough electrolytes in my body and enough sodium that like I can keep more of my energy for longer. So I've started going more like coconut water, yeah. watermelon water, like these these naturally occurring fruit juices that have sugars that are easier to digest, but still have like natural occurring electrolytes. And I've found like that to be a much cleaner energy source for me as opposed to like pounding a, a rock star or a red bull or you know and i'm a coffee guy and i love coffee and these, oh, I love coffee. you know but i'll still notice if i have too much coffee or if i drink it too late in the day where like there's a crash involved afterwards and and finding energy without having that crash is what you need for a sport like this where you're going to play two games in a day or be out there for six hours in the heat you know working out right and i can't do hot coffee or well i do like doubles and quads um I'm just going to do a shout out for Noble down there in Ashland. It's yeah. like one of my favorite spots. It's like my top tier when I want to sit down and just literally take 15 minutes to. We got good coffee down here. K oh. Case coffee is really good too. That both yeah. those places are roasting their own beans and sourcing them directly from like Central America and Africa. And I'm, I am on board. I'm actually coaching the son of the guy who owns Case Coffee, Tim Case um, oh, cool. and Katie Case. Their son Yanni is on our 12U travel ball team. So it's like, you know, shout out to Noble and Case for bringing really good coffee to to Ashland. Ashland. There's also a place out Ashland. in Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah. you got to check beans. out. Uh, good beans. Or good beans, good. Yeah, there's Cerber Cer Cerberus, I think. Okay. Cerberus. It's like right on the corner. Cerberus. It's right on the corner as you're going into Jacksonville, and that and they're a legend out there. They got some like really good coffee. North or on the other end of town. As you're coming into town from like the Phoenix um oh, side yeah. like okay, yeah, yeah like right 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 when you go to that intersection right. where like some people aren't stopping and some people are it's like right, right on the left there on the corner you got to go exactly. check them out i think it's like there's no orange building it used to be a gas station or something yeah <laughs> cerberus yeah it's good go good there. coffee there, go there. yeah check it out we yeah. have a weekend off this weekend and i will hit that up before my daughter's double header um, yeah um so then uh you ended up taking over uh for the rogues um and coaching and you got to coach with a friend of yours, right? Yep. Coach Parker Berberette and I, who also played at Oregon state, he was also in the Milwaukee Brewers organization as well. He was in there for seven years as a catcher first, and then as a pitcher afterwards for another couple of seasons, which is a wild transition for anyone. Once you get to the pro level to like decide you're going to be a pitcher and then extend your career another couple of years. So really special coach. And, and we're fortunate that he married someone who went to South Medford high school. So now we got him down here in Southern oh, Oregon good. as well. And he actually took over the head coaching position this year. I stepped away from the rogues to focus on the youth baseball and the softball stuff. And, yeah. and Parker Parker's coaching the rogues this season. So wishing him all the best. And we're so grateful to have him involved. He's a, he's an amazing coach. And I got to tell you something, he has the nastiest slider I've ever seen. It's fil it's filthy. He can still throw like 90 miles an hour with command right. of like four pitches. And it's, I'm, I think I'm the only person in the men's league who can catch him because everyone else is like terrified to get behind the dish. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Okay. No, the first time he threw that slider on me in the men's league, I swung at that. I saw it. I'm like, Oh, slider. And, and I'm, I'm, I chased that ball as if it was going to cut away from me. That thing yeah. sunk. And I have this picture in my mind of my barrel, literally a ball and a half over the ball right here. And I'm like, I swing, I turned it, I turn right around to the catcher. I go, what the hell was that? Was that his slider? Did it snap? <laughs> he goes, he looks at me, he laughs. He's like, yep. And I said, throw it again. <laughs> <laughs> throw it again. I need to hit it. <laughs> I know I wasn't going to hit it. I just wanted an opportunity to go, okay, a slider, that slider's coming. Can I adjust to it? I was just like, yeah, throw it, throw it again. And I, I think he did. I, and I think I got right over the top of it at that time. And then they mixed it up on me. And he, he, he struck me out that that at bat. Yeah, yeah, that's not that's not the pitch you want to swing at, and you're at bat against Parker for sure. Oh, like you no. got you got to find that fastball for sure against him. You don't want to swing at the other ones. 
Unless you guess they're coming and he hangs it, I guess. I never guess bitches. I just do straight react. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. Tough, you know. tough to react to his changeup and his slider for sure. Right. Yeah. I, I only played high school baseball, so uh, I'm living. I, I I don't do men's league anymore. Um, I mean, I can't. I can't hit his pitches either, man. I don't. I don't want to face him. I do want to face him because <laughs> like, I always want to face the best at their best. You know what I mean? And just go, okay, yeah, they own me. You know, so. Nah, not me. I'm ready. I'm ready for that BP fastball, baby. Just lay it in there. Let me see if I can hit it over the fence. Still. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, with the Metro Rogues, uh, as a coach for the Metro Rogues, um, mm-hmm. you get all these boys from all over the nation, really. Yeah. Uh, I remember we, there was a couple guys from Georgia, I think, and and whatnot. It's a wood bat league, which makes it really mm-hmm. fun here in Metro for um all the younger kids to to go after practice it's just you know it's start game time is usually 6 30 and all that kind of stuff and um what about getting all these different college kids to play for two months i mean the season mm-hmm. is two months long and then there's possibly there's a postseason usually and that kind of stuff i mean as a coach how, how do you get these kids to to just jump into a team and then uh just start playing because that that's got to be tough. I mean, I can't imagine just going. Okay, I got my five first baseman over here, four you know shortstops, three you know third baseman. I mean, is it just because they're in college they can they can handle it, or uh, I just never coached at that level? So well, it starts it starts with the recruiting process and just establishing really good relationships with the different coaches who you're talking to around the country and every, every program's a little bit different, right? We have probably 15 kids coming from division one programs and then another 20 who are coming from junior colleges, division two, NAIA, division three schools. Right. So it's a, it's a mix of people who some kids are getting used to treated like big leaguers all year. And some kids don't have a hitting coach at their school. Right. So it's a little bit different for everyone, but the first thing is just making sure that you recruit the right number of players for each position so that there's not uh, like complaints from people about playing time because these coaches send you players and they want them to get innings over the summer. They're not going to send them to you if they don't think you're going to play them. So, you know, certainly with number of catchers, like three catchers is sort of what you need. If you get four and they're all healthy, then a couple guys aren't really going to get the time that their coach wants them to get. And you need, but you need to plan for injuries at a certain point too. And, you know, then we get them like a day or two before the first game happens. And I think the first year, the first year, I think we really made sure to talk to coaches about the character of the players. And that's, and that's how most big schools are now recruiting because there's so many kids with talent. The thing that really separates them is their character. So and talking to coaches who also have that same mindset and just asking them about the quality of the character the players are sending you and then establishing a really good core group of guys who are going to bond and yeah. still work really hard. And then after that first season, we were fortunate to have like, I think eight to 11 returners the next year and having those returners who, you know, are going to be the foundation of the culture of your team was really a really a big one and we've just been really fortunate with the with the players we've gotten and you know just trying to facilitate for them and really listening to them and hearing being available for them what they need but you can't just go in changing someone's swing because they have a college coach and multiple hitting coaches and they're going to go back and play with them all year so it's a little bit trickier in the way that you're coaching where you have to find ways to coach with approach or with feel that aren't necessarily going to contradict the mechanical adjustments that other coaches from their school are trying to make. So it's a little tricky, but it's also really fun and relaxing because the results don't matter as much. And it's, it's a chance for college players to work on something from their game that they felt they struggled with the previous season and then just really enjoy the process so that when they finish summer ball, they're not completely burnt out, but they're like excited. They had a great time. And then when they go back to their school, they actually got a little bit better. So if, if any college coach sees a kid going away to summer ball and they come back and they have learned something or they gotten a little bit better, even if it's just like the happiness that they have from the summer experience, like that's enough for a college coach to say, okay, that's a program that we want to be sending more kids to in the future. And so every year as it goes, you just start, being able to build, you know, better and better players, better relationship with schools and the school, you know, if Oregon state sends you one player the first year, they might send you two the next year and three the next year and university of Oregon. And we had a Washington guy and Cal state Fullerton and 
a lot of these schools have coaches who we played with or coached with. So that helps a lot having been through that and knowing them, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then talking to them during the season and just saying, what do you want him to work on? What are you seeing? Like, like tell me what you want this kid to get out of this summer. And then just knowing that and really working for that school and for that player, as opposed to um, just trying to put together wins for a summer ball team and and the wins happen. That's like a byproduct of a strong work ethic and, and good team chemistry. So we know that we've seen that uh, as players. And so that's the way we coach as well. Yeah. Well, it's nice to get that court a, then everybody can feed off of that and then assimilate with or not. And then you can see who's doing what. Um, there was one player that uh, huge, tall pitcher. Remember Hunter? I think his name was Hunter Cope. Is that right? Yep. Holy seven, smoke. seven foot one. Right. So, what 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 did he top out that year? I, I I thought there was three digits a couple times he hit. Is that right? Yeah, he he sits at like ninety five, ninety seven, and okay. the, and I don't know. We don't we didn't have a radar gun going the full time I, all the time, but he yeah. certainly had to be like upper nines always and I, we got him from university of arizona when nate yeski was the pitching coach down there who was previously at oregon state and i coached with him and he told me this kid's gonna throw 100 before the end of his college career right um and, and just freakish i mean even par- coach berberet was like the only one of the only people who could catch him in his bullpens because it's not like a normal 97 when it's coming out of the hand of someone who's that big. Like the ball yeah, is on to top of you. Yeah. It's crazy. It's like, it looks unlike anything you've ever seen. And he struggled a little bit with his accuracy, but I'll tell you right now, he threw one inning at a time right. based. And that's what his coach wanted only thrown for one inning at a time. He threw five innings. He gave up zero runs okay. and he got 15 strikeouts. Out. Every out was a strikeout in five innings, right? So, so it's like he walked a few guys. Three times. Yeah, yeah. He he walked a few guys. He gave right. up a couple singles, but every out that was made was a strikeout. Right. And then, and his swing was so freakish. If we had a shutout, um, we would let the pitchers hit batting practice right. the next day. And I'm telling you, this kid steps up to BP, and his third swing with no warmups is like ten feet over the scoreboard. And you're like, what is going on here? And so, sure enough, later in the season, everyone's like. Hunter needs in that bat. Hunter needs yeah. in that bat. And and you're thinking to yourself, like, oh my God, if this kid gets hurt and right. his at bat, like we are in trouble big time. But it got to the point where you're like, all right, it's a late in the game. He's gonna get one at bat and we put him in and he hits like an opposite field double off the wall or something like that. And it's like, okay, I mean, just a freakish athlete to be right. able to move like that at that size. And Another he's at Oregon State. Johnny. He's at Oregon State right now. Currently, he transferred there when Nate Yeski left Arizona. And he okay. just he he's been through a little bit of uh, he I think he had surgery this last year so he's like recovering from his surgery and his future career is kind of up in the air but he's enjoying his time at Oregon State and he's rehabbing so you was know we wish him all the best. Labrum or what? what he, or- I couldn't tell you okay, honestly. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know exactly what it is. But it was just something in his shoulder that you and he was okay. injured when he was throwing ninety seven for us in the summer. It's like an injury that had been there for existing and he was always kind of complaining about his release and just feeling sort of weird. And eventually they just like dug in there pretty deep and looked for something. And we're like, yep. Okay. There's something in there that requires a little surgery. Yeah. Me too, man. Yeah. He's got a fast fastball, but what was insane was that change up. I was like, that looks like it's 30 mile differential. Well, yeah. I mean, and it came from the same slot as his fastball. And, And I saw that and I went, Oh, this guy could go a long way with that yeah just those yeah i was like because you'd sit there and you, if you're down the third base line you kind of go huh like this right yeah and then all of a sudden the changeup came and i'm like huh and then it kind of catches up after the fact and I was like, yeah right what the heck was i know that? yeah dude pitchers who have can keep the same arm speed for their change up is always yeah. the hardest to hit like most guys just slow down a little bit and kind of right. push it and he and he just like let it eat like that guy was not scared to just let it rip which was really cool Oh man, well having those bigger fingers probably helps too. Just oh yeah. Off, you know, so anyway, wow. So uh you're now uh you set up Southern Army Baseball Development, I think about a year or two ago. Yeah, Coach Coach Berberet and I are are running that program together, so we're still coaching together with that. And so you got twelve U and a thirteen U and so how many kids do you have total off between the two teams? Uh, we have 12 for each of those teams. And then in the fall, we do a 18 U showcase team after the high school players finish with the local American Legion program, the Mustangs, as you know, we take them from like August, September, October, and take them 
to a couple tournaments and then also to showcase games against other travel organizations like at universities and junior colleges just to showcase our athletes against those schools because being from southern oregon if you're not a pro prospect or a division one prospect it's really hard to get exposure down here we're not in a place where a lot of you know division two schools and junior colleges are like coming down here to you know pick our athletes up so there's a lot of kids always who graduate who probably could have played college ball but just don't get looked at enough to be able to have that opportunity so i saw that happen when i was in high school down here and that's kind of the focus for us is to find places for these kids who have the work ethic and the determination to make it work. Um, even if it's not at a school like Oregon state or Oregon, we're going to find a place that they're going to go and be able to develop their skills and continue to play baseball at a competitive level. And, and you just never know with people like that. There's a lot of different ways to make it to professional baseball. And, you know, you hear different stories all the time. You do not have to be a four-year player division one school to play professional baseball. You can, you can be anywhere and do it as long as you're focused on your own game and you're working hard like that. That's everything. Don't compare yourself to other athletes. Just get a little bit better every day. Yeah, I remember I, uh, last spring, last year, we were up in, um, excuse me, it was September, not spring, it was September, and uh, I was at the Dutch Brothers across the street from um, the ball field, and here comes Lake, or Lake Ridge, uh, Oregon State's baseball team, and so they come walk in, and they go over, somebody forgot the keys, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, uh, and I know this because they came walking back, and, but anyway, Everybody goes by, and then here's like 25 freshmen. Mm-hmm. You can tell they're freshmen because mm-hmm. they're coming in, they're smaller. And you could see like children in the freshmen and then full blown adult men. Yeah. And so I, I was just, it was something that I was pointing out to my son Adler when we we're having coffee there. I was like, dude, there's a baseball team. Look at that. They're going to the ball field, you know? And he's like, oh my gosh. And so, you know, he got excited and everything. I said, you tell which ones are freshmen. He turns around and goes, "Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah." I go, so- yeah, there's a lot. There's a big difference. I mean, those a lot of those kids will put on 10, 15 pounds of muscle in the first year or two of college because they've never worked out like that before, right? right. They're not used to getting up at five thirty in the morning and hitting weights three days a week and then, you know, shoving food in their mouth all the time. It's like the first time you're dedicating yourself to a, a really good weightlifting program, and you're also eating a ton of food. I mean, these kids, you you see them fill out, and also like COVID and red shirt years that these kids have injuries they have i mean you've got 18 year olds and 24 year olds on the same team and i mean there's a big gap between what a 24 year old man looked like and an 18 year old boy coming out of high school looks like so you certainly see it it's pretty rare i mean i wouldn't even suggest kids to be heavy in the weight room until they're you know like into puberty and like starting to really develop seriously i you know there's certain things you can do with mobility and and uh, form and stuff like that and range of motion. But for most of these kids, when they get to Oregon State or a, a big school and even a junior college and they're working out that hard for the first time, they see major gains in their in their muscle mass. Right. Um, yeah. So for him, I was just like, never, ever be afraid when you get into high school that you may be the smallest kid on the team or in college. As you can see, these kids were seniors in high school is what I told him. So they were the big man on campus in their high school. Look at mm-hmm. look at them right now at a D1 school, a high top tier D1 school. I go, they're 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 the kids again. They're not the big yep. man on campus anymore. Now there were a couple freshmen that looked like just, you know, freaks. I mean, and, and in a positive way, like, you know, probably six four, you know, and in that kind yeah, of Yeah, or like quads that are like huge yeah. already. Yeah. Right. right. And, and, and so I could kind of tell because they were hanging back in that group and everything, but they had a little swagger amongst the, the freshmen. So I was like, okay, he's probably a, a fresh, a freshman as well. But yeah. it was, it was fun to see because, you know, that was fall ball. You know what I mean? So it was like, this is the introduction. Those kids just came off summer high school, you know, Legion double A or whatever. And so now, that, now they're getting the awakening in uh, fall ball. So the introduction. So, Oh, uh, let's see here. Um, with uh, Southern Oregon Baseball Development, um, I know you do the, the showcases. Um, now, in these showcases, typically a, a showcase is there because there's a lot of uh, college recruits mm-hmm. and people to uh, rate people. I mean, you probably go, are you going to perfect game 
tournaments or what tournaments are you going to you triple sa or just no it, we're not going to tournaments like that to get okay. to, for that the, the tournaments that we go to are more to get game experience for our players right. and allow them to continue to compete throughout the summer um because we have some younger players on that team too who we just want to like let them see what really good competition looks like yes. because they being from southern oregon they haven't seen people throwing mid to upper 80s right like that's just like pretty rare down here you occasionally get one pitcher but it's not consistent so just getting them those looks before they're getting looked at by a college coach is really big like if you're not ready to showcase then you should not be going to these showcases because you will do more damage for your future if you go there and show poorly you'll get your name crossed off a list and they won't look at you again until like you do something so amazing that they recognize it. Right. So, so a lot of our high school players, we'll just tell them like, look, man, like before you go up to that showcase, like let's make sure you have command of three pitches and you're throwing harder than 79 miles an hour. Otherwise you're not helping yourself by going to this. So, you know, there's, there's a fine line where like some of your athletes are ready and some aren't. So we'll go play in tournaments in like Vegas where there's good competition, but there's not necessarily a lot of scouts there. So it's a great experience for the boys. They get a lot of the at-bats that they weren't able to get throughout their high school season. And then we'll go play a showcase somewhere so that these kids have got like 10, 15 ABs against good pitchers before they're going into the showcase so that they can handle a good pitcher a little bit better. Because even if they're not there to see our players, if they're there to see one of these really good pitchers and you are the one person who succeeds against them, that is going to be a big deal to a scout, right? If they're mowing everyone down and no one looks like they're ready to hit – 85 to 90 miles an hour and there's a couple guys on the team that are like comfortable with that and not look doesn't look like they're getting lucky it looks like they're hunting that fastball and they're not scared by it at all and I mean you notice those things as a college coach so even if you don't hit a double off the wall if you have a long at bat you're taking healthy swings you work a walk or let's say you get out three times but it's all three really good barrels and it's like a deep fly ball and a couple hard ground balls like that's going to be enough for a college coach to say all right this kid's got discipline they can barrel the ball they're not scared to face somebody who's really good and it's like those are like the little intangibles that really set players apart once you get to a certain point and everyone's got a lot of skill right and you were mentioning players down here um, one popped into my mind Trey Newman he's yep. North uh, Medford and yep. I and I know he's been playing on a team up in Vancouver or something like that, BMW, whatever it's called. Yeah, Benz. Benz, thank you. Yeah, yes. he played. He played for our 18U team last fall. Oh, good. Yeah. So what yeah. was he topping out, or what is, was it? 91, 92. I'm yeah, not- he's like high, high 80s, low 90s. Okay. Yeah, and I, I've heard he's already had a couple 91s and a 92 so far this high school season. And I, he's yeah. he's signed to University of Oregon, I believe. So yeah, he's yeah, I heard I heard that as well. Yeah. Yep. So he's, he's headed to be a duck and, um, you know, it's an awesome, awesome program up there. So yep. it just hey, we're any, always any program in the PAC 12. I mean, you're, you're good. <laughs> yeah. It's a good school too. I mean, anywhere where you can go and, and honestly, most of these players should be looking at it. Like I have a place where I am able to develop and I'm also going to end up with a great fallback plan of having a, a degree from a four-year school in the meantime. And it's like, that's, I think for, that's the most you can really, yeah. And like that, well, and that's the most you can ask for. If you, you need to go to a place where you believe that you can grow as an athlete and also set yourself up for life after baseball. Yeah, man. Oh, dude, this stuff is so fun. So fun. So uh, Southern Oregon university, what are you doing mm-hmm. with the softball program? Yeah. So I am an assistant coach with them. I work with the hitters a lot and I, other conversations are had obviously hitting ground balls, fly balls. And, um, but I, I just, honestly, I, I volunteered my time to them this year. I had written the head coach and I just said, Hey, I'm in town. I'm a coach. If you need an extra hand to hit a fungo or flip some batting practice, like I, I'll show up and I'll just help y'all out. Cause it's, you know, I know it's a, NAIA school and they probably have limited amounts of paid coaches and I was just fortunate enough that there was a opening um, with one of the positions and I sat down with the head coach Jessica Pistol and we just clicked she liked a lot of the things I was talking about when it came to the swing and her and our her other assistant coach were both pitchers 
So they were, I mean, they were a great hitting team. They hit one of the best hitting teams in the country the year before, but I thought it was really cool that even though they were, she still let me come on to help out um, with the hitters. So just spent time in the fall working with everyone. And, and honestly, most of my job was just convincing them how good their swing was. You know, they'd, they'd miss hit a ball and come back to me and saying, what's wrong with my swing? And it's like really? nothing. It's like hitting a ball's hard and you were just a half inch away from smoking that ball, or you were just a little bit early or off balance. And here's the video showing you. And they look at the video and be like, Oh yeah, that was a pretty good swing. I just missed that. So at least the next time they go in to the box, they're not trying to make a physical adjustment. They're just like, focusing more on timing and contact and letting their natural abilities take over. So that's been my, my biggest one from this team is there's so many good hitters uh, on the team already. My job is basically to convince them of that and then just make, make their results a little bit more consistent, but not really making a lot of mechanical changes. So you were assistant coach with the bees D one boys. Here you are mm -hmm. with college SOU. Now for most people, SOU is a top tier NAI program uh, oh yeah jessica has won two national championships with mm -hmm. back, to back with sou mm -hmm. uh, and so who works harder boys or girls oh i mean <laughs> you know what i mean uh okay um yeah no i know what you mean i know what you mean i have a great answer for this okay so it's okay. like the difference that i see is not necessarily in the work ethic but in like the full team buy-in and the support that I see from these softball players is like the thing that when you're coaching baseball, you you have this dream that like everyone's going to be on the same page and pulling for each other. And they're not they're going to be healthy, competing for a spot with each other, but also rooting for each other at the same time. Mm -hmm. And and that's what you have on this full team. And I, I, I was in disbelief the first time I started working with them because, you know, they're they're just so dedicated. I mean they're climbing to the top of Mount McLaughlin and swimming 15, you know, 10 miles and biking for 10 miles. And it's like in preseason just to like build team chemistry. And I mean, we'll go through two hours of personality tests with everyone just to learn like how people want to be talked to and how to approach them after they've had failure and like, you know, really like learning about the personalities of each other where in baseball, it's like, you might like teach that and you see that from some players, but there's also this air of like, like, well, I'm better than that guy, or I deserve the spot more than them, or I'm going to be a pro guy, or I need to make a million dollars after baseball. And I think the reality of college softball of most of these women knowing that there's not million dollars worth of contract at the end of this, right? Like they know right. that, that them being here in college and getting to go to college and play softball is like, they're at the top already. And so they really cherish their seasons way more in college than I think a college baseball player goes through and then it finishes and they're like, Oh wait, these are all the things I could have done differently to make it better for myself or make the experience better where like the women are so hyper aware of that, that it's like more emotional for them when they don't do well in practice just because they care so much about playing well for their senior season, not about impressing a scout, right? They want to do it for themselves and for their teammates and for the coaches and for their parents. And like that amount of selflessness really creates an incredible culture. And I think that's part of the thing that coach Pistol has done with this program, which has made her so successful. And it's the only college softball program I've been on as a coach but I coached a player at Oregon State named Kyle Novak, who's a current assistant coach at University of Washington softball. And so I've had a lot of conversations with him since he started coaching softball a year ago, just about the situation, the differences between that and baseball. And, and he says a lot of the similar things I do. So I, I have a feeling that it's it's just something different about softball, where you actually get full team selflessness and buy-in and people competing um, for spots, but also pulling for each other and rooting for each other. If if someone's not making a spot, they're not angry with the other person. They're more right. frustrated with themselves for not for not being in a better position to put themselves in the starting spot. Yeah, it you know in that culture, it does start at the top. I mean, Jessica Pistol. When I like, I've seen her play over at US Cellular a couple those those two years that they were there. We went there for the, I think it was the semis one year, and then it was a regional. They were there the other year. And mm -hmm. um, 
when she walks on the field, you, you remember I talked about Pat Casey. She's she's got this air around her that because um, I watch a lot of co- women's college softball. You know, we've talked about that, but um, mm-hmm. but she reminds me. There's two two other coaches in the Pac-12 that she reminds me of, and it's uh, Melissa Melissa Lombardi mm-hmm. and Heather Tarr. And yeah, Coach Tarr. Yeah, has, she, Jessica has that that aura around her that it's just like you could see it. You can absolutely see it, just like you did with Pat Casey. And um, and, and I saw it before she won her first one. I was just like, wow, look at. I mean, it was just something that you could just see. You're just like, she gets it. She just, you know, and 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 when you see it, you just, I admire that. So yeah. it was just a quality that I, I saw before they won their first one. And I was just like, ooh, okay. And I saw, and I knew how they won. And when, when they won, I wasn't surprised. Uh, but the second, that second championship that they took, they came out the hard way. They mm-hmm. lost the first game and then they had to grind all mm-hmm. the way up. And what made that championship, absolutely the best for uh southern oregon was uh they're playing um oit about what hour and 15 hour and 30 minutes away uh, yeah for the national championship and oit came in the 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 just winning into the game and so it was it was uh it was impressive to see them grind from the losing the first game and then getting to that point and then winning and so like I said, man, it's just so these these coaches and players just it's so enjoyable to watch that stuff. It's just I don't yeah. know, you get a lot of joy and glee out of it, and just to know that they're right here and uh, in our in our community. So anyway, yeah, that's awesome. OIT OIT is currently ranked number one in the country, and and SOU is currently ranked number five. So there's a good chance that you get to see that matchup in the postseason again. <laughs> that would be I would love it. I would love it. Yeah. I, I really don't care about the outcome. I just want to see good softball, just, you know, the pitcher, the hitting, all that stuff. So um, super special for the young softball players in this Valley too, to have two different four year universities, both with completely different curriculums of school, right? One's like a technical Institute and one's like a arts college here. And so regardless of what kind of degree you want, you've got top tier four year programs right here where you can still play locally and go through all four years of college. So it's, it's pretty cool. And the other thing about coach Pistol is she just had her fifth kid this last season. She coached third base completely pregnant last year. And now she's got like a nine month old at practice every day. And her nine year old's like oh. pushing the one year old in a stroller. In, and then she's like breastfeeding between games on the bench in the dugout oh and like coaching at the same time. I mean, it's, it's a wild situation. You don't get that in, in college baseball. What, she, she is a badass. Facts, dude. Facts. Oh. She's, she's insane. Really awesome woman too. And like super compassionate and friendly person. But also, like you said, she doesn't have to say a word. If she steps out onto the field, you feel the presence yeah. and everyone wants to like step their game up just because coach is watching. It's just like yeah. Pat Casey is the same thing. Like you were saying. Yeah, uh, in, yeah. You just remind me of another coach that. Oh, well, it's all right. You don't need to be a dead horse, but it, it's so enjoyable to have that here, and um, I can't wait for this year's to the develop or the season to develop here. So, um, now with softball, you know, defense is played a little bit different, mm-hmm. and especially the bunt defense. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I like it. Um, I like these different. Uh, strategies because they max out the possibility of getting an out mm-hmm. they have to play it um, the bases are a lot smaller than baseball so this is why i love women's college uh, softball is it's fast mm-hmm. some of these girls ladies are they're diving three feet past third base on a pulled line drive uh, you know just jack and mm-hmm. they're moving because they see that barrel in front of that ball and they're like oh this is foul i better move and then mm-hmm. they lay out and catch that line drive and I just sit in flat out amazement going, I can't say the dudes would be able to do that. I'm sure they could, but it's just, we don't see that because they're not in that position. Because I always wonder, can can the guys do it? You know, I'm sure they can. Yeah. But to see uh, the, just the miraculous plays that are made on the infield alone is just, it's so fun to watch. And it's faster paced than baseball. And, you know, it's the same game. And then, you see some of these personalities and these ladies, whether it's the eye black or the hair or whatever it is that, you know, is very, you know, for them, 
uh, and then when they perform, it's just it's like, man, yeah, you know, I, I gotta watch that team again. I gotta watch that team. Again. Yeah. I, I I don't know what it is. I, just, I guess I love baseball and softball equally. Yeah. You know, but I, I will say, in the infield with softball, you the efficiency of your footwork and getting the ball out of your hand and getting rid of it is way more important, right? You can't catch a ball at shortstop, ball. take two shuffle steps to first base, and let go of the ball and get somebody out, right? You right. have to like have your feet set up to throw to first, get the ball, take two steps, and like get rid of it and it's and even then if if the hitter hits a chopper to shortstop or like the right bunt even if it's right back to the pitcher if you have the right weight on it it, you're gonna have a really hard time getting someone out especially if they're left-handed with slap with with slap hitters and slap bunters who are already a foot out of the base or out of the batter's box by the time they make contact and i mean we have hitters who are so fast and left-handed that they can miss hit the ball and hit a, like a routine ground ball to second base and they're safe every time. Yep. And like that, that level, like you said, and, and I noticed takes of the hitters too, where you have to get your load started so early that you're almost landing the second the ball is out of the pitcher's hand to be ready for a fastball. Right. And that's for a baseball player. It's like you, you kind of have a little more time with that load and and the so you get better takes in softball right like the takes that you get in softball are aggressive like oh like stop yeah. having to stop yourself because yeah. if you're not generating that swing every time Too you're late. not going to be ready for that softball getting on right. top of you on a fastball right right yeah so and then like obviously trying to hit a rise ball is a completely different thing that you don't get in baseball so oh. it's like you know you you think about that pitch for the first time and and i think baseball people don't realize that that pitch is hard to hit no matter where it is in the zone. It's not like a rise ball up here is the one you're always swinging at. If it starts right. at your knees and it ends up at your belly button, yeah. like that's a tough pitch to hit no matter what. Like you're going to pop that up or hit a foul ball. It is so hard. You honestly have to think about swinging like that far above the softball. Yeah. 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 And yeah. it's yeah. like you, and that's it. It's like a mental mind game. You get in the cage and you're trying to hit it off a machine. You're like, how far above this ball do I need to think to swing to make any kind of contact? It's a, it's a trip. It's a reaction, too. Because if, it, yeah. if you sit there and try and do that and not just react to it, it's going to be yeah. Much harder to see the seams on a softball, too. I stepped in yesterday against Coach Bricker when she was throwing live, and you do you cannot read spin on, like, a screwball, fastball, rise ball, drop ball. They look the spin because the ball's green and the seams are red. It's not like a white – like a dark seam on a white ball like you get in baseball where you see, like, right. a little eye on a curveball or you can, like, really yeah. tell when it's, you know, backspin or topspin, curveball versus fastball, like – it is so hard to tell that out of the hand. And because the ball's so big, as it's coming into the zone, it like mm -hmm. even when it's going away from the zone, it still looks, it looks like terrible. it's in the zone for a really right. long time. Right. And so you end up chasing pitches out of zone. I mean, I have so much respect for softball hitters, and I'll use a lot of my softball swings on my phone to show my baseball players to be like, this is the kind of take I want you to have. This is how you need oh, to set right. up to be ready to hit every single pitch and then learn how to shut it down when it's out of the zone in the last second. Yeah. Well, you mentioned something that you have to get your foot down and oh yeah uh what's funny is you can't trigger with that foot in the air try no. I, I tell my boys all the time it's like if your foot's in the air and the butt got he's released it you can't trigger no matter how hard you are your hands are right here until you land that front foot you cannot trigger so yeah um, not just the foot not just the whole foot um right. but like a lot of guys land on their toe Mm -hmm. You know, the softball players, too. And then they never get that front heel into the ground until they right. actually start swinging. That, boom, that ball's there. Super and it's like you got you to gotta find a way to get the whole foot in the ground somehow before you start generating that force. Otherwise, you're going to be off balance and your body's not going to be in a good position to handle those forces that you're putting into your swing. Right. Well, luckily for me, I've been catching my daughter. She's a pitcher and she's got a rise ball in and a, a roll drop, a screw, a regular fastball and to be honest with her, her changeup is the most deadly for a right-handed hitter. Um, she was working with uh, – her her first coach was Jen Mendenhall. And she, yeah. she was a star here at South Medford and then went to go play college ball and made the uh, – she was an alternate on the, the one of the USA, like, 19U, 20U teams. But she got injured, so, you know, whatever. But she was fantastic. She led both in hitting and in pitching in her conference. And so she she – when I was catching these change-ups, I catch and I just sink my head like this and she'd start laughing and I go, she's like, what's wrong? I said, you can't hit that pitch. <laughs> that ball, it literally, and it wrote, it barely rotates, but then it slides away on a change-up. 
Yeah. And I go, how did you teach her that? And she goes, I didn't. It's just the mm. way she releases it. You can't teach yeah. her, her release. And so my daughter still has that change up. Cool. And it just, just fools these hitters nasty. And, you know, it's a totally hittable pitch, but it's when it slides, sorry, you're not going to get it because it's not over the plate. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I've caught that. And then her roll drops. So, you know me, I, I like to pick up on, you know, pitcher's tendencies. So I know all of her tendencies. So if she wants to try and blow one by that, she probably can. Don't get me wrong. She throws that rise ball. I'll probably swing and miss the first couple of times until I figure yeah. out, you know, hit over the top of it. Um, but her roll drop, I mean, when it comes out of the hand, you can, you can see the way the ball starts to move. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing I can think of because you're right. You really can't read the spin rate. Uh, her, I can't because, you know, she's 14. But mm -hmm. as she gets older and starts to release, I won't be able to read that spin as well. But I can read the hand. So, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, but anyway. that's how I would read changeups for baseball pitchers. Most guys in, in high school and college, they'd have a tendency to like like push it, you know, like shot put it a little yeah. bit instead of like really letting it go. So you could actually pick up that changeup before seeing spin because you just see them kind of like push a pitch instead of really release it properly. And that's like like we were talking about earlier with arm speed for changeups. It's like you have to find a way to release that changeup at the similar arm speed and release point as your fastball if you really want to fool hitters. And I love those videos that they're now doing where they overlay release point. And the mm -hmm. balls do this, 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 this. And yeah. The same release point in the big league. Yeah. And yeah. I, I looked at some of those and I'd go, that's nasty. That's yeah. Nasty. And all of a sudden you're like, that's why it's so hard for these guys to hit this dude. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's only a few, you know, there's only a few that can do it out of all, everyone around the world. I mean, it's not, I mean, let's say 15 to 20. Yeah. Same slot every time, but then have the ball do this, this, this. No, there's not that many in the world that can do it, but. Yeah. And I think we'll get more of those because now the boys know that they need to find a, I don't know if it's called tunneling or channeling. I heard, is it tunneling? Where yeah. Tunneling. Tunneling. Okay. Yeah. I, I just learned that a couple months ago and I was like, cause I'm not a pitching coach, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you something. If I see a kid swing, I'll go down to Jason. I'll go, dude, belt high away up and away on this swing. Cause a lot of these kids are coming in with these bat angles, like 45 and greater than 45 degrees. And I'm like, you can't hit the outside plate at all because you have to get your hands so far up that at best, if you're an athlete, you'll foul it off, but you won't put it in play with any strength. You'll probably top it, you know, normal one, two hopper to the pitcher or an, uh, one to the shortstop. So that's what I do is I look at hitter swings and then I give my input and just saying, Hey, throw this guy this, you know, but I don't pitch call, but, um, if I see I mean, that. that's what Parker does for the college level, right? It's like the higher up you get, you can still see those things. It's just harder once you get to like certain levels and everyone looks like they have a good swing, but then you start realizing like, oh, God, no. all right. I mean, if someone's un unstable in their feet on a fastball, it's like yeah. try and get them to wait for an off speed pitch and just watch them like dance in their yeah. shoes in the box. Yeah. And it's like, they got no shot at hitting that. It's all upper body because their, their bottom foundation is not going to have the timing if they're dancing. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's like, don't throw that person a fastball ever. Just keep throwing yeah. them off speed and watch them like dance and fall apart. That's it. Yep. Yep. Oh man. We could talk for hours on that. I'm sure. So, um, but on softball, bunt defense, I wanted mm -hmm. to bring this up because uh, it's different than in baseball where the first baseman actually crashes mm -hmm. uh, two reasons, usually the, uh, for the pop-up catch where the pitcher can't get to it, but because of the bang, bang mm -hmm. speed of the bases. So um for me, that was something that was, uh, well, I talked to my wife about it because she played softball. And she's like, she goes, you just can't, you have to bring everybody in. Second goes to first. And first base, yep. Yeah. And so um, I was like, okay. But um, I guess the other thing I wanted to talk about was that rise ball. Because in baseball, there is no ball that rises. It just won't drop and it makes it look like a rise ball. Yeah. Right as it stays on plane, it, because it doesn't do the normal drop, it looks like it's it's rising. Uh, mm -hmm. But the girls actually hit a ball that actually moves up. And yeah, because the release point's so low. So right. if you if you have like a low release point and you're throwing upwards a little bit and you're back spinning it really hard, like it's gonna plane out like a four seam fastball does, but the and angle's already up. a little bit up. Right, yeah. exactly. And so that is a new dimension um to hitting. Because oh, yeah. for uh baseball, you know, that ball starts out on this plane, it's only gonna do one thing. Move this way, this way, and drop. 
yep. or stay right on flight. It's yep. not going to go here and then up. Nope. That is. Unless you're a submarine pitcher and you got a low release point, you, you know, that's like the upward, only time. Yeah. Uh, upward yeah. slur. Yeah. But that's it. That's it. And that in, yeah. And in, in how many p- pitchers in the big leagues are doing that? I know of one, I don't know his name. I saw him the other day. He was, he was throwing that and they're like, this ball actually moves up. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I'll give you that. That ball does actually move up, but not yeah. like every pitcher. I mean, you'll have two or three pitchers that could throw a rise ball and soft. Yeah. Ball. Yeah, well, in the MLB strike zone, I think is like the belt is like the highest point of the strike zone for MLB, right? Or like the belly button. So it's like you have to get down to the dirt because you're elevated on a mound. Right. So like even if you're throwing sidearm, you're basically about strike zone height already. So unless you're like knuckle scraping the ground and you're on a mound, you know, it's like hard to create that upward angle. It's like most of the time downhill or straight, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Just take the pitch. And if he hits the zone or if the umpire misses it, so be it. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. And I'll then, set it up in here. I, I do those rise balls on these three wheeled machines like this one you see behind me right there, like the hack attack. Oh, yeah. Is it's that a hack, a attack. hack attack or junior. That's a regular. That's that's the regular. And then okay. I got the junior on the oh, ground okay. right here for cool. softball setup, Right. Yeah. And so I'll crank the bottom wheel at like full speed right. and put the top two wheels at like a five. And it'll just backspin the crap out of it. And since it's on the ground, like it throws a really mean rise ball, right? So it's it's awesome for softball hitters. I'll get them in here. And even the young ones, I'm trying to train my high school hitters, even though they're not really seeing a lot of those pitches, I want right. them to know how to hit it. So the first time they face that, you know, high school player who just signed to go to UCLA and she's got a nasty rise ball, it's like, that's your opportunity to stand out. Like if you can be the only person on the team to make some contact off that girl, like you're going to turn heads. Yeah. You're going to go play with Paramo. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> smokes, dude. I would love to just get in the box a couple times against her best stuff and just, I, I get, I know I'd be embarrassed, but I, I just want to see it because I see it from behind at the angle, you know, where the camera is and everything like that. And I'm like, gosh, I wish I was in the box. I just want to see it out of the hand. I want to see it. And and try and react to it with a. Softball. It's nasty, dude. It is I nasty. Know, but you could beat me up, pitch, and I don't care. I just want to try. That Good. Is- I love that. That's what. That's the mentality you got to have. See, I was I was like the other guy. I'm coming out of college ball, being like, I never want to face Randy Johnson for a single at bat in my entire life, being a left handed hitter, and I'm just like. Yeah, that's one I'm probably good not ever having to have that experience. No, thank you. But I will tell you, it does get it does hurt a lot more to get hit by a softball. And I know that's hard to believe, but oh, wow. those balls do not give at all when they hit you. And it's like you can get hit barely by a softball and it feels like a rock got thrown at you, or like a baseball with the like softer leather and the way that it's woven with yarn. It's just that's not what a softball looks like when you cut it open. It's like so that more plastic really with a core. Oh, hard yeah. shell harder leather on the outside like it just doesn't give it all it just smacks you like a like a piece of stone i mean it it hurts a lot so credit to these ladies for stepping in against pitchers where you have little reaction time you're not going to be able to get out of the way of it and you know if you wear it it's going to hurt a lot but you know they still are in there just hunting fastballs in the zone which is always really impressive it's you can tell the person like i don't know there's no fear in the way that they swing and and i just appreciate that as a coach yeah no well, I'm, I'm coaching 11 U, so I, I still got there you go. I'm still in the development phase with these boys. Um, I know they get hit once and then they step out in the bucket for like the next two games because they're scared they're going to get hit again. It's like, oh, come on. Yeah. Well, fortunately, we don't have uh, that type of uh, fear of getting hit. Our, okay, the boys good. That are in there, they've been, they play enough that they've been hit enough. And um, we ha- actually had this one kid. He's not with us this year, but we're hoping to get him back next year. His name was Carter. And Every it was just he was ball magnet. He was our mm. number four hitter at the time, and he'd just sit there and then he'd just put the bat down and just wear it. Didn't matter where it was, he just wear right. it. And he was a great example for the rest of the team. And they're like, "Hey, cars that hurt?" He's like, "Not really." And he's a bigger kid, but um, you know those smaller ones. But but they, they all learned from him that hey, take the take the free base. Except yeah, especially with two strikes, man. That's like when I see someone get out of the way of a curveball with two strikes, I'm like, you are stupid. <laughs> just wear that. Just like, come on, turn inside a little bit. Just let yeah. it get you and just get your yeah. base. That's a free yeah. base you're getting handed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man, you're sending memories through my head and my memory bank right now is saying that. Oh, man. Um, so Southern Oregon fast pitch. 
Um, how did you get involved with uh, Becky? With that, with that organization? Um, I was giving lessons to a lot of the youth softball teams in the Valley already. Um, right. Individually, or I would get whole teams just recommended to me from different coaches who I knew in the Valley. And so once my name was sort of getting passed around as the instructor and then, you know, just word of mouth in this Valley is really important. It's a small Valley. So you really can't get away with like burning bridges or, you know, not having good relationships with people. So, I mean, I, I really work on like fostering those relationships and, and not trying to insist anything. I mean, I help people as they want help. I'm not telling parents they're doing stuff wrong. I just try and find a way to be constructive. And I think that really, helps um, me just work with a lot of different coaches. I, I find that it's the softball coaches I've worked with so far are more willing to let me work with more of their players where baseball coaches feel like they know more. And, right. and quite frankly, like they think that they, they can't really tell the difference between like what my instruction is going to be like and what their own instruction is going to be like. So they're like, they might bring a kid or two, but it's not like they're encouraging their whole team to come get hitting lessons from me. And that's what I've gotten from a lot of these softball teams is a coach will bring them in for a session. I get along with the coach. Great. And then they see great results from their players. The kids really enjoy the training. And so the coach is like, this is awesome. We can focus on something else during practice. We'll bring our whole team to you once a week and we'll do hitting. And so by the time I'm working with 10 U12, U14, U and a handful of high school players, when a local softball organization wants to open up, I mean, I'm kind of the guy since I'm right. coaching softball at the college level and, and already working in youth sports. And it just, it just works out that way. So, yeah. you know, just trying to trying to get involved with that program as much as I can without sacrificing the commitments that I've already made and just being flexible with what the future looks like. And really as, as long as I'm able to help young athletes in baseball and softball in this Valley, like I don't care if it's in baseball, I don't care if it's in softball. My, my goal is to help as many young players as I possibly can um, and give them the information that I wish I had when I was their age, but that I didn't learn until after high school or after college or into professional ball where I'm like, man, if I knew that when I was 12, by the time I was in college, I would have never had to even work, worry about that. But then, you know, instead I'm like learning how to take a three, one change up in college or in the pro levels when it's really nasty, instead of like really focusing on that in high school, because it was too easy in high school just to wait till the pitcher let go of it read what pitch it is, make a swing decision and then hammer the ball, right? Like you can right. see fastball. Okay. I'm going to hit that fastball. But like, once you get to the next level, it's like, if you're not geared up for that fastball, it's going to be by you, right? If you're waiting to read the pitch, you're not going to be in a position to be able to put a good forceful blow on the ball by the time it's there. So, you know, just trying to work with a lot of our young hitters on approach stuff with that and, and really selling out for a fastball in most situations, unless there's a specific pitcher, who's got such a good fastball that, you know, one of their other pitches might be the better one for us to swing at. Mm -hmm. So um, this is your busy season because I've asked you to come and join my team uh, with hitting. I remember that a couple months ago, mm -hmm. like five, mm -hmm. five, six months ago, but going into mm -hmm. dinner. And you're like, well, I'm kind of doing all this. And I was like, that's fine. Um, so <laughs> you're going to be uh, after what, mid-June? Is that when the, the World Series, you know, the playoffs are done for – Southern Memorial Day, the end of May is the national championship okay, for good. NAIA softball. Yeah. And so then once once we get to June, it's basically the tr the travel ball uh, stuff right. for me. Yep. Right. And so um, because I want you to come in and talk to my boys, because the thing is, is you've got all this history, Oregon State, national champ, Beaver, this kind of stuff. And you and I have talked hitting a lot. And we I, I think we're. It could grow. I haven't disagreed with you and what you said and, and yeah, no, it's pretty similar stuff. Right. And so, but hearing the same thing from you can really elevate a couple of the boys that probably are just like, I've been with you for two and a half years. I've heard this over and over and over and over again, but you know, it's like, well, Hey, he's got a national championship ring on that finger. He as a baseball player and a coach for the bees. Mm -hmm. So uh, remember what Bill said, because anytime uh, I get a kid not listening to me, I always refer to, I go, what Parker tell you? Because we have a couple of kids that go to Parker as well. Yeah. And yeah. hey, he told me to do this, they do it. You know, yeah. 
No, because it's the same thing I'm, I'm doing. Yeah. I'm saying it differently. But if they have it in their mind that, hey, Parker does it this way. Yeah, okay. That's exactly what I'm trying to get you to do. But I'm saying it differently. So, but I yeah. tell them, that. I'm like, then do that. And all of a sudden, yeah. I get them to do what they're doing. And so yeah. I can't wait for you to come uh, and and with me and, uh, and our team and, and work with the boys. I really am looking forward to it, man. You are a gem of the Valley, Southern Oregon Valley here. Oh, stop. You are that. too, Justin. Oh, come on. Anyway, the thing is, Bill, is I love the fact that you're here. Um, and, you know, you offer hitting. Uh, you got your own little uh, barn there, you call it, right? Um, yeah, yeah. We're, we're in the, we're in the cage right bit? here. Yeah, so I'm inside the batting cage right here yeah. all the way down. And then we also have, like, the whole farm stuff, including my drum set over here, which is yeah. awesome. You see, we got got my drum set right here. So wow. I had the... I had the 10U softball team in here last night. And while we're doing competitive swings in here, the other team is over here blasting drums and trying to distract the hitters as much as possible oh, while great. we're in here trying to compete just to create more of like a game time distraction, right? Because yeah. when the game's happening and the pressure's on, your parents are there and everyone's screaming. It's like, you know, a lot of times the quality of the swings that you get in game is different from what you get in practice, right? Sure. So in here, that's one of the things I'm doing is like trying to ramp up the competitiveness and the, and trying to distract them with the atmosphere in order to like force them to like feel that and then like step out refocus and try to execute even in those big moments right and and i think that's a big one but like you said a lot of the youth players i get i'll get a parent to come in and just say hey like i've taught them everything they can and they're just like starting to not want to hear it from me right. anymore like they've heard it from their dad for years and I was in that same position too, where like your dad's your coach for 10, 15 years. And all of a sudden he's like saying the same thing every time, like get your arms extended, get your arms extended or whatever it is, squish the bug or whatever it was back in the day that, you know, people used to say. And then you're like, uh... at a certain point, you're like, okay, like you've already told me that. I don't think that's what it is. It's got to be something else. Either find a different way to say something else, or I should right. just listen to another hitting coach. Right. And it's like, right. I, I think it's interesting when you do say the same thing and you see the kid be like, okay, cool. And then they make the adjustment and they hit the ball. And then you look at the parent and they're like, I've been telling them that for six oh, months. Why aren't they? <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, man. It's like, I don't know what to tell you. I'm glad they're listening to you all of a sudden. And I, I try and really encourage the kids to buy into whatever their coaches are telling them. Right. Like right. I tell kids, you're going to have different coaches your entire life. You're never going to agree with everything that one coach tells you. Mm -hmm. It's your job as an athlete to buy in, listen to everything the coach is telling you, try what they're teaching you. And if it's not for you or it's not helping, like eventually you're not going to tell the coach that you're just going to be like, okay, I'm going to find a different way of doing what the coach is trying to tell me to do, but you still have to buy into what your head coach is saying. And I, the biggest thing with these, these private lessons is not creating that tension between me and those coaches who are coaching them. Right. Like I oh, want to compliment no. what these other coaches are doing and not do contradict them. You really do. Especially with the ones that you work with on our team. It's just, it's like, it would Bill say, do it. Yeah. 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 So, Parker and I are on the same page. And I think we've yeah. learned when you're coaching at Oregon state and there's six or seven coaches on that team and you're not the, the main hitting coach. And these players are going from six different stations around the field. You don't know what those five other coaches have just told this player. Right. So by the time you get them at your station and you're throwing them something like you have to be careful with what you're telling them because they've already received a lot of information. Yep. And, and if you start coaching mechanics, it might contradict something that someone else just taught them. So you learn how to coach based on feel, right? Instead of saying yeah. swing down on the ball, you're like hit a hard ground ball to second base. That way you're not yeah. like changing a swing plane. You're just changing something that they're thinking. Like think about hitting the, exactly. Think about hitting this little spot on the ball instead of right. just looking at the whole ball in general. Right. So yeah. little things like that, that you can teach like balance, right. Balance is a great one. Like can have consistent balance throughout your swing, like feel the ground. Like those are things that like no other coach is going to be like be unbalanced or be off the ground. Right. So it's, it's a, there's little cues that you can give that are just going to come complement what other coaches are doing and you don't really have to change mechanics necessarily well what's really great with our uh coaches that we have for the generals antonio doesn't have a child on the team or anything like that this is his second team where he hasn't done that but um 
when he comes up, he's like, what are you working on? He always asks me that because he doesn't want to contradict anything that I say because I'll be like, hey, we're working on his hands. Remember, he was casting and he, he was rolling the ball down instead, yep. right, instead of going through it and hitting it over the second base instead. Yeah. So he, it's really nice that I was, and that's in response to you saying there's five coaches, they're on stage yeah. number six. Well, what were they working on that they're now working on in this station that they need to work on? And you're like, okay, um, you're augmenting your foundation to work on what you're doing, but let them work on what they're doing so they can get the hands in the right place and then they can add it in the cage on, you know, soft toss or live toss or, you know, off the machine, whatever. But uh, yeah, no, and that's really important. Um, as a coach to understand that and know that. And, you know, you, you demonstrate that day in and day out. So. Yeah. Very important to have those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Those conversations are really important yeah. between coaches and parents and, and kids, especially when the kid isn't able to articulate really well, exactly yeah. what they're trying to work on on their own swing yet when they're 11 and 12 years old. It's like, if you don't have the conversation with the coach, you're going to get the kid stepping in being like, I don't know what I was working on. And it's like, well, yeah, you do. Like, what did the coach teach you? Like, what are you trying to do right now? And they're like, hit the baseball. And it's like, right. okay, it's more complex than that. I guess I need to go talk to the other coach instead. Right. Right. So normally I do a really thoughtful question um, in my podcast. And the one I have for you is this, is that as a coach mm -hmm. um, and with youth coach, you know, I'll include, you know, the college level um what impact has a player made upon you sorry i'm thinking about the one that that stopped you and and made you realize you're actually really doing something for these kids yeah i would say it was coaching little league um i was giving lessons out at the local little league park and there was regularly this young kid who would just like show up and he was like seven years old and just be like sitting on the bleachers by himself just in like ratted jeans like super stoked and it's like well that's kind of weird there's this young kid out here by himself and he's like asking to help me coach or get swings and he's never played baseball before or organized a day in his life and you come to find out he's like you know, was homeless last summer living with his pregnant mom in a tent while she had a baby and he like refused to go to foster care because he wanted to help his mom out and the dad's in prison and like baseball. He's never played baseball before, but it's all he wants to do. Right. And like mm -hmm. taking a kid like that shopping for a glove or a helmet and like showing them like what baseball can be, it, it becomes so much bigger than the sport itself. And I think it's hard to realize that as a player, especially when you grow up with a family where you're very privileged and you have a support group like that. And, and you realize like the game is so much bigger than what's actually just happening on the field. Um, and I think that's before I, that's what's got me into coaching youth sports in, in general, I wasn't really excited about coaching youth baseball or softball until I dug in and like started to learn more about these kids. And so um, just teaching them the lessons that are going to help them throughout their entire life and not just help them become a better athlete. I think that's the most important is, and that's what you take away from playing organized sports. When you're an adult, you realize like the skill wasn't it. It's like being a part of a team, handling adversity, handling pressure, handling failure, like these working with a group of people that you might not get along with, but in this situation, you're all on the same squad and you're all trying to accomplish the same goal and those things translate into the personal world and the work world it's so well that I, I just think those lessons are invaluable. And it's it's that's the greatest part about coaching youth sports. And that's what I learned from this young man uh, last year. Wow. wow. Oh, is there anything you want to share? that you haven't talked about or I haven't pulled out in the question or anything like that before. Well, I just say, I'd like to give you credit, man. It's awesome to see somebody like you who's like not getting paid doing something like this. And you give so much of your time to your son and the rest of the players. And now you're like out here trying to, you know, get the information out to people outside of just the people that you're in touch with. And you're, you're really reaching a, a greater audience and, you know, it's not a glorious lifestyle and, you know, it's sometimes you're, making videos for two people to see, but it's like, you never know when those two people are the ones who like desperately needed to hear that message 
in order to help them like continue to go on for another day. And I think those, those things, you just got to keep on the grind. Even if it's just helping one person every once in a while, it's still a completely worthwhile mission. And, and you and I are brothers in that mission. And so I appreciate you very much. And, and I just appreciate you having me on to let me, let me talk about my experience. Thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. Thank you for listening to the Travel Baseball Coach Justin podcast. I have four guests slotted for the next week or two. None of them have been able to commit just yet. But in about a week, week and a half, I'll have my next podcast. So stick around.